All right, good morning. How's good everybody? morning, good coach. Morning. All right. Yeah. Hey, uh, just a couple couple quick ones here. Um, you all were in the punting, uh, I guess, field or, you know, but how did you all look at uh, Jake Camarda? Kid for, from Georgia who ends up down there. Coming out. Yeah, Jay coming out. Thought he had a really jo- strong leg coming out of you know a really good university football program coming out of Georgia. Strong leg, athletic body type. Uh, did a good job flipping a field at Georgia. Has a punter and kickoff specialist. Does a good, great job getting hang time on punts, and he's able to flip the field whether he did it in college and now doing for Tampa Bay. So we look forward to the challenge this weekend versus Jake. In the book on Rashard White, one of their returners. Rashard White, White. Yeah. big, powerful back, north-south returner. Uh, does a good job getting vertical with the ball in his hands. Doesn't look really bouncing outside, so we're excited. Going against a big uh, returner like Rashad White is going to be a great challenge for us to make sure that we're tackling, getting guys to the ground. So we're excited for that opportunity. And then just from my notebook, since she put me on the spot last week, um, it's a four point. I had a four nine six on the fifty yarder by opinion. Um, Zach, I, I think that's great to for enough time for the guys to get down. I just wanted to uh, get your assessment of that. Would you use your stopwatch or was your iPhone? iPhone? iPhone, okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it goes back to yeah, I like the catch mechanics right there. It goes back to you know the correlation with location, distance, and hang time. You know, that's what we're looking for. You know, location, are we getting the ball where we want to when it comes to directional punts? Um, the direction, make sure if we say we're going to punt the ball one direction, that that ball goes that direction, and then correlate that with our with the hang time as well. And with our gunners, with those guys getting downfield, doing a great job of being disruptive on the returner, yes, that is a good punt for us. Last year when Cordero got hurt and then he came back, he didn't really do as much in the kick return game after that. With him hurt again, obviously he's not back for at least a month. Like, do you start having those conversations again of like how much he can really do kick return wise long term? Because well, of what you well, just because he's a starter on offense that doesn't necessarily say he's not going to help us on special teams. And yes, he, right now he's not with us. But that conversation is not when he comes back. We will have that conversation. But right now we're focused on the 53 men that are on this roster right now. So whatever 53 guys are going to help us right now and the 48 on game day, that's mo- most important. Yeah do, yeah, do we want CP back? Yes. But once he gets back, we will have that conversation when it comes to him being a kickoff returner or whatnot. But again, whether Avery's starting on offense, Algiers starting on offense, whoever's starting on offense, they can still start on special teams. And they can and they will start on special teams because we're looking at putting the best players out there to help our team win on Sunday. I guess I'm just asking that because he is – lobbied so hard for very specific reasons to to have that job as long as he possibly can. Yeah, of course. He wants to help flip the field. That's the first play on offense. So all those guys, along with CP, there's a lot of guys that are not on starting on kickoff return that want to be out there on kickoff return. No different than punt, punt return, or kickoff. This is a good issue to have where we have guys that are on the roster that are not starting on those phases that want to be on those phases, whether they're a starter on offense or defense. So that's it's just not CP that's lobbying. It's a lot of guys in our room that are lobbying to start on various special teams units. And as you get guys back, whether it's Isaiah, now that that window is open, or mm-hmm. some other guys down the road, how does that shuffle maybe some of what you have already established in terms of guys in certain spots? Well, it goes back to what Coach Smith talks about in Terry. Our roster is always changing, always evolving, and we're always looking to get our roster better. So with having Isaiah back on the practice field, which is great to have him back. He's a veteran player going into his fifth year. He's played on special teams for us last year. It's a good problem to have because we get the mix, mix, mix and match pieces in different spots when it comes to special teams. And that's why we carry a small menu so our guys can have a big understanding on various roles that they play on special teams. So it helps us be more diverse with having various guys that could play on various spots and have, have different experiences playing on different special teams units. When it came to moving Avery from defensive back to running back, how much comfort did, you, did y'all get from the fact that he does have the returning skills and just is used to having the ball in his hand? Yeah, yeah, he carries those traits as a returner, ball security, knowing how to run with the ball in space, having an understanding of how blocks are set up, vision, break tackle ability. So you, you saw those traits, him coming out of Boise State. And 
big credit to him as a player and as an individual and as a man being able to adapt, learn our offensive schemes and being able to contribute on offense, which as a returner, that's your first play on offense as well. So it's a big credit to him and he, for, he continues to get better day in and day out. His punt uh, return average is pretty high. Um, what do you like about that number? I think it's about 13. He only has five returns, I think, but like, do you see good decision making, which is leading to productive returns? How do you evaluate that part of his game? It's a, it's a combination of a lot of things. It, it starts with the line of scrimmage. Our guys, whether they're blocking at the line of scrimmage, we always talk about winning early in the down. If you're correlated or tied to the line of scrimmage, you have to win early. Pad level, stance, your get off, blocking. So our guys blocking on the line of scrimmage, it starts with there. Or rushing the punt, the, the effect the punter, the force him not to hit his, uh, as best hang time punt or directional punt. And then our jammers, where you talk about D. Alford, Mike Ford, they're doing a great job out there, D. Hall. Richie Grant getting those blocks out there because those are the fastest guys that get downfield. Because we got to understand in a punt formation in the NFL, only the end men on the formation, they could get downfield first before the ball's punted. So eliminating those guys, those guys are athletic. And then it goes down to Avery, Avery catching the ball, clean catch mechanics, and getting vertical with the football. You know, those numbers, only number I care about is can we gain a first down for our offense? Because if we could gain a first down for our offense and return unit, then that's one less offense. Our, one less first down our offense has to get, and we're that much closer to the end zone. So it starts with the line of scrimmage, guys blocking downfield in transition, returner making great decisions, and getting vertical football so we can gain a first down or more first downs when it comes to that. In terms of his decision making about when to make the return or when to fair catch or let it go, how do you evaluate that part of it? Just more so like where are we at on the field, field of play, is there a guy in your face? You know, because a lot of times, too, if you don't call for a fair catch and you're this close to me and I'm trying to catch it, it could be a bang, bang play. Now the ball is in jeopardy. The ball could be on the ground. It could be a fumble. And we, like I said last week, the number one thing on, in the return game is make sure that our offense has the ball in their hands, Scott, when it comes to that. So we want to make sure our offense has the ball the very next play. So it's the various things that happen, whether it's the field position, um, they're hitting the ball inside the 10-yard line, is their gunner right in front of your face, when the fair catch, when not the fair catch. And punt return is a really hard position to play because you can have a guy that has great running ability and does a good job running in space, but if they don't have great decision-making or ball security, then all that goes out the window. That answers your question. This might be very, very technical, but how many guys do you have that can make calls like in terms of punt? Like, like kind of what Eric, Eric oh, has to do. Oh, protector? Yeah, like how many, how many guys do you feel like you're on your roster that can make some of those reads and calls? Oh, we have quite a, quite a few. We have quite a few guys. Everybody that's correlated with our punt pro, they, and they have to be able to call our protections. That's how we get, we're set up in our room. We don't want to just be fixated on just one guy doing it. And because if injuries happen, things happen, the guy has something happens where the next guy has to go in and be able to play that position. So whether you're playing the PP, whether you're playing the guard, tackle, slot, everybody in that room should be able, if we pull up a protection or pull up a rush, they should be able to call that protection out. And they can in our room. So it goes back to just having a big understanding of what we do conceptually as a punt unit. Does the punter ever do that? I mean, or is he so far back that that's... He could call it. He, he knows the punt pro before sometimes the PP will even call it. And that's great for him because the more that you know what's going, around, going on around you, the better you can execute at your job rather than just knowing your job. It's not good enough to know your job. The great ones at this level that play at this, the highest level possible, not only do they know what their responsibilities, but they know what's going on around them, which allows them to be more aggressive and execute and play more freely with their position. What I was getting at more is like from just a spacing situation, yes, like the punters so far back, realistically the gunners are so far out. Like I'm guessing that's not ideal if they're mm -hmm. having a, it's, it's gotta be somebody in that. In yeah, it's somebody back. in there. And yeah. again, we all wanna be on the same page. We wanna make sure where the protection's going, where's the issues at when it comes to protection. Cause everybody runs a lot of great schemes when it comes to punt pro and that ball is getting off in less than two seconds. So our punter having an understanding of where the issues are at, what's the protection call is for that week, who's the, who's on their personnel who could bring issues to our, to our punt units. Everybody needs to know that. And then gunners need to know that too. Hey, they know that there's a lot of guys in a box. They got to know, Hey, I'm single press. So, the ball is probably, I'm going to be, I have an opportunity to go make a play rather than being double press. It's probably going to be a return. So 
having those guys have an understanding. Now, as a gunner, you're not going to be able to see that from that viewpoint. As a punter, you're only 14, 15 yards away. You could see the protection. You could see what kind of rush is going to happen. And you could probably have a good feeling of what our PP is going to call when it comes to protection. Calling it, that's probably mm. nah, we don't need him to do that. <laughs> He's just focused on catching the ball and punting it. And uh, Desmond Ritter holding. Um, how do you teach somebody to hold at the pro level? Well, I was actually looking for you pre practice to come out there and hold, <laughs> but you kind of ignored me. Yeah, I, I was looking for you. You didn't want to come out there. Coup made you nervous, huh? Yeah. Hands got all clammy and stuff. <laughs> Well, you just work on ball skills, catch mechanics, and then understanding how the, our kicker or kickers at this level, how they want the ball held, whether they want a certain tilt with the football, they want the laces pointing a certain way, making sure that you're putting the catch in the ball and putting it down on the necessary spot because that's the spot where the kicker expects the ball to be. But with Desmond, there's every week we work on various things, whether it's a backup long snapper, a backup holder, because things happen within the game. And we want our players to be prepared without the opportunity and unprepared with the opportunity. So it's all about us as coaches putting our players in the position where they have the tools to be successful, just in case something happens. It's part of crisis management. Uh, just uh, what is, um, I wanted to ask you how to measure the evolution and growth of a defensive unit as you've seen your unit uh, in the last two games with big plays. Well, I just think they're playing better because they're more comfortable with the calls, understanding the calls. Just, the, you know, the longer you play the same stuff, even though we do a lot of stuff, the, the more you play it, the more comfortable, you know, you become. And I think that's part of it is that, that the problems that we have had in the games have still been communication errors. Um, when we've given up a play, other than like if a guy just makes a good catch, guy makes a good catch, you know, or he beats a coverage because it was the right play against the right coverage or something, that you know that's that's football. But usually that's not a big play. The the plays like a couple of the runs that we had towards the the uh, end of the game, you know, they got 46 yards on two runs, and we, we were just it was miscommunication and we. One, we set the front wrong, and, and another one, we just miscommunicated something else. So as long as we're communicating and stuff, we, we got a chance. And that's basically been kind of that way all year, and it's still that way. We just got to keep working on communicating and making sure everybody's on the same page. And if they beat you because they block you, if they beat you because a guy makes a great catch, that's pro football. Uh, but they don't want to beat yourselves, and that's kind of – Luckily, in the last couple t games in the two-minute drives at the end of the game, we haven't beaten ourselves. You go back to New Orleans, the first part of the season, we beat ourselves in the two-minute drive. We miscommunicated. I told you, pressure that we ran in the third quarter that got a sack, we totally wouldn't even know it was the same pressure in a two-minute drive. Why? I don't know. But that's the stuff you can't, you can't, just can't do that. You can't give teams you just can't give them plays. And that's, that's, as long as we're not doing that, we got a chance. And uh, when I was covering the Packers, Reggie would always make the sack in on third downs when mm -hmm. they needed it. And in the last couple of games, you got sacks from Grady when y'all needed it. Is, uh, you know, what, what does that say? Is that a trap? I know it's not playing, that's just a player, I think, maybe rising up. It is. It's just, just it's making a good play, and, and uh, he's just, he's making a play. I'm not going to take credit for scheming uh -huh. something up that, they got got him. Hey, he just made a play. He did a great job, made a play. But along with that, some other guys did the right things too. It isn't just whenever somebody makes a play, like if it's an interception, whatever it is, usually there's more people involved. And in that particular case, the secondary did a great job of disguising a coverage and it didn't look anything like what it actually played which made Jacoby hold it just a second longer, or at least look. He couldn't just plant the back foot and throw it. And by that time, Grady had the guy beat. And so there's always, you know, yeah, it was Grady making a great play, but it was also the secondary doing a really good job of disguising a coverage to, so Jacoby couldn't get rid of it quick. How does Tampa's offense look different right now, maybe versus what you guys saw last year? Well, I think the reason that everybody thinks they look different is because they've had a bunch of players out. Take Mike Evans out of a game. I mean, he's going to look different. 
and take, you know, Bray, uh, the 84 got hurt in the game, so it looked different. Godwin was out. I mean, golly, start taking all those guys out of the equation, any offense is going to look different. So, but those guys are back. So, you know, we got to deal with it. Wait. When you look at some of the, I know you're talking about Grady a lot, but when you look at some of the pressure you guys have been able to generate, why do you think that's happening more, it seems, late in games now? Like why it seems like that, is there, is it just a game situation where maybe they're having to pass more, or? I don't know, that, that would be up to the, the offensive coaches from the other team to explain that one, I don't know. I, I just calling the game and, and what I feel like is the right call at that particular time, hoping it's right, and uh, sometimes they're executing. Bottom line is we're just executing better at those times. Not, not any magical thing that we're doing. It's just there. We're, when we execute, things happen good. How do you feel things have been going third down lines? If that's better. better. We still got to improve. We had – the biggest problem in the last game to me was out of the, I don't know, what was it, 14 third downs or something like that. They were – I don't know what they were. Maybe it's five twelve. I don't remember exactly. I know they were thirty six percent, but out of the five third downs that we gave up, that we lost on defense, three of them were third and ones. The biggest problem is second down. You know, we had them a couple times second down and ten or something like that, and we throw a check down, which if we make the tackle, it's third and five or third and six, we, and we missed a couple tackles, and now it's third and one. That's that's. That's tough duty on defense on third and one. There's a lot of things they can do. And uh, it's always, you just look around the league, the percentages are not going to be great for defenses on third and one, usually. When you get Isaiah back, how will it affect what you're able to do? Nothing. It, it won't affect anything. It'll just be a matter of when we get him back, when he's ready to be back. Um, it, it won't affect anything. It won't change how we call the game. We won't check. It won't affect how we pressure or what, how we cover. Um, it'll be just getting a good player back. So Mike and Dee and, and Eric at times have handled that spot pretty, mm -hmm. pretty capably for you. Yeah, it's been good. It's been by committee a little bit, kind of like it was last year. Uh, but Eric was just that really that kind of that one game, the LA game, because we had we were doing a lot of different stuff, and I thought it was hard on the younger guys who hadn't played the position very much, and easier on Eric to do it. That's part of the reason why we did it, because he's so smart. And we we're trying to do some things uh, against Stafford. And just thought it would be better for him to do it than the other two guys. But Mike's been doing a good job. D's been doing you know, a good job. Uh, and so you know, there will be competition there with Isaiah coming back. So we'll just figure out what's the best, peop best thing to do with the guys that are involved. We'll try to, try to make the game plan such that We'll ask them to do things that they can do well. Last year you had said that Isaiah was a guy that could do all of it, and that was what really you liked about him and his sure. skill set. Is it still the same? I mean, the person, I guess the person that you have defensively, do you, is it still, he may be still best suited for that, or is it more, I do will, you have more guys that can do it? I will all not that? know that, Mike, until I watch him practice and full speed. Uh, so I can't, can't really answer that, you know. Uh, I, some guys are better covered guys. Some guys are better blitzers. Some guys are better in zone. Uh, what I do like is like when I had Logan Ryan at Tennessee, when I had Webby, at, those guys could do it all. It was great. Did I think Isaiah could do that a year ago before he got hurt? Yes. Do I think he can do it now? I don't know. And I won't be able to give you an answer on that until I see him play or actually practice a lot and go full speed, full tilt all the time. Just to go out there and, and a jog through is not going to tell me whether or not he's ready. We got we got to watch him full speed in practice to see if he's capable of doing it. And but I feel like if he can't, we, we still got two guys that are playing very well. So hey, hey, let, me, let me rephrase that a little bit. With what Mike and D and oh, I was, I, Eric only in one game, but really Mike and D. Uh, having more than one guy, does that somewhat tip defensively what you're trying to do because those skill sets are different? I, I, that's something I literally just don't know. Does, does that tip things some way? Or? I don't know. Again, you'd have to ask an offensive coach, but that'd be just like saying this guy out of corner is a. When they study us, 
they're going to say, is that guy a good man coverage guy or a good zone coverage guy? Can he do both? They study every one of the guys. So I don't think it's a tip off as much. On defense, you're going to always try to do things to not tip them off. I mean, it's not like, okay, every time D. Alford's in the game, we're going to play man coverage. Every time that uh, Mike Ford's in the game, we're going to play zone coverage. It's not that at all. I mean, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I can kind of figure out from the other side of the ball that I could probably figure that out pretty quick. So it's just the same way, okay, you're going to put in this tight end, well, it's going to be a run because all the guy can do is block, or they're going to put in this tight end because all he can do is go, go out for routes. No, they're going to put tight ends in and make sure that you know that the guy can catch the ball and he can also block. So that's, it's, no, I don't think it has anything, has anything to do with it. The, uh, the, the uh, takeaway count is pretty high over the first four games. Is there anything that you attribute that to? Too. I know there are all different circumstances. But just playing faster, yeah. I think. And again, I understand the defense more. And whenever you understand it more, you play faster. And usually if you play faster, you create more turnovers. You have bigger hits, all that kind of stuff. That Because uh, guys are playing fast. You usually don't get very many turnovers when especially fumble cover, recoveries and stuff like that because you're not getting very big, big hits if guys aren't playing fast. Right. You know, you get those uh, doing a little better on the interception thing. Um, you know, but again, it just kind of really depends on the coverage. If you play man coverage, you're not going to get a lot of interceptions. You're really advocating sacks because if it's kind of hard to intercept the ball if you're looking at the man. Right. And when you play zone, you're looking at the ball, so you're advocating probably less sacks but more, you know, uh, interceptions or turnovers. So it just goes back and forth. And I hope we're at a point where you really can't say we're a zone team or a man team or what kind of zone we're in. So that's, that's our goal. How have you seen the defense progress in a uh, red zone situation over the last two games? They've played better. Again, I think the more you do the stuff, the more comfortable they are. I think we've changed some things a little bit to try to help our guys a little bit. Um, the, the thing of it is, is that, you know, the red zone's a misleading deal. You, you really have to study it sometimes so to, when you look statistically at the percentages of red zone stuff. All right, if you, if you look back even at the first two games and where we were, everybody would say, well, you're, you're not playing very well in the red zone or not playing well enough, which is true. But how many times were we in a blitz and it's just one-on-one -on -one wide receiver against a DB? So it doesn't really have anything to do with the coverage or the scheme of things. There's just at some point in time, you're going to blitz. You're going to say, I'm not going to let you run the ball in. Okay, so when you say that, that's going to put two corners on an island. I don't care what team you look at, that's what it is. And if they fare well, everybody says you play good red zone. If they don't fare well, you're playing poor red zone. It doesn't have anything to really do with the whole red zone scheme. It has to deal with one-on-one -on -one battles. And early on, we didn't win those. Lately, we have. So it's, it's made a difference in just winning those one-on-one -on -one battles. We can go out here and practice a bunch of red zone coverage and a bunch of different things you do in the red zone, but those weren't the things that hurt us in those first couple games. It just came down to one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, your back's against the wall. I ain't going to sit there and play cover two or what you guys call soft coverage by the media. So. <laughs> Football would suggest that defensive coordinators love a run game, love it when their offense is running the ball. What was your reaction to your, your guys' 14 straight runs? I showed her and I actually turned to the defense and said, we're playing good defense right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting on the bench. <laughs> it was just like pound, pound, pound. And I go, hey, we're playing great right now. <laughs> yeah, that, it is. Oh, absolutely. That clock's running and there, and it's, and it's, and it's disheartening if you're on the other side of the ball and they're running it and you know they're running it and you still can't stop them. Yeah. That's, that's hard. You look out there and, and uh, I remember looking even at the end of the Seattle game, like when after we got the interception, we, we needed to kind of get a first down, right, to kind of seal the game so we'd have to go back in there in another two minutes. And when you look out there and you ran the ball and you look at Seattle and there's three guys laying on the ground on their defense, that's a good feeling for our defense. So 
That's, that's not where we want to be. All right, guys. What's the offense change without Cordero? Well, again, I think it goes back to what we've been preaching uh, since we've gotten here last year. If you have a helmet on game day, um, we hold a certain standard, and those players have a certain standard. And regardless of you got a bunch of reps in practice or uh, you're working scout team, but you're up on game day, there's a certain expectation. So for us offensively, uh, it's to continue to execute, pay attention to details, uh, and play fast. The offensive line has been getting a lot of credit for that drive. Uh, that happened last week. But when you go back, the wide receivers are blocking. Kyle Pitts even talked to him after the game. He was like, my job was right. to block in this game. How important is that kind of mentality? Yeah, I think it's – those guys, you know, you love to hear that because it is – it does take all 11, and those guys are bought in. And it takes all 11 in the pass game too. I mean, I, I know the 14 runs in a row, and I know the run game. Uh, the reality is it takes both, regardless of your run or pass, to execute at a high level. Um, what I will give the offense credit for is – the mentality and the mindset in which they take each snap. And that coaches can preach it, but the players have taken ownership on it. Um, it's starting to become their own. And then when you have a player led um, offense that has certain pride level to it, uh, you can go out and you can be successful regardless of what's called. Coach, is the quarterback sneak a lost art in the league these days? Y'all had one earlier, but I mean, you see people on the one and two getting fancy. Sure. And, 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 you know, when the quarterback sneak, uh, you know, seems to be the logical call. Yeah. No, I think it's one of those things where I have been around certain quarterbacks that have a knack for it. I mean, I think we're playing one this week uh, that has a, has a phenomenal feel. Uh, doesn't always hit it right in the A-gap. He bounces it, and, you know, he's probably had as much yards on quarterback sneak as any quarterback in the history of the NFL. Um, but also now teams' defenses are, are playing for it differently. Uh, than when even when I started as a player in this league. Um, and so there's a certain level of success and execution that has to go on for that to be successful. Um, but again, I, I do think it's where you feel your best chance to get that first down or get that score. Uh, if it's not in the A-gaps because they're taking it away, then you have to have another answer for them. You mentioned mentality and mindset. We've all seen the clip now at this point where Arthur says, we're going to run the P out of this ball and says something similar to the players. How does a coach saying that and having that mindset affect the players in that moment? Yeah, again, I think it's more about a, a direct um, idea of what we're going to do next, right? So what you say is what you mean. Obviously, after that comment and everything else that fell forward after that, there was a, a want and a need, right, to get us back on track, to be efficient, to be efficient on first and second down. And obviously, it led to us, you know, going into the run game. Um, but again, if you're a player and you hear a coach say that and then obviously then follow through with it, right, there's obviously a, a trust and confidence level that goes with say what you mean. And so obviously we have open communication with our players. That's been the good thing about me being down is just my ability now to go to different groups, communicate with them, uh, hear the different issues, and then get everybody on the same page. Um, so it's a different feel in general. But again, obviously if it's coming from the play caller, the head coach is saying it um, and doing it, it gives players confidence on that. Talking about that feel, what feel were you getting from the offensive lineman, the offensive line group during that stretch? Yeah, I just think it's in general. I think guys, you know, we obviously hit a stretch. Where we had like 19 plays in the first half. And in the second half, we hit a stretch in which we weren't staying on the field. And obviously, you need to convert on third downs. You need to stay on the field. You got to stay out of third and longs. Um, and we weren't doing that. And we were kind of self-infliction was happening. And so for us, right, it was more about just resetting our – getting our, our thoughts together, making sure we're all on the same page, and then obviously going out and executing. And so you could feel it. We were stalling out a little bit, and just guys had to regroup, coaches included, and I thought they did that. Does it can be effective running the ball when the whole world knows that you're going to run the ball? Do, do you think that has a psychological effect on the opposition? Sure. d led you know we're running the ball there? Yeah. yeah there you go. Yeah. Uh, look. Oh, Woody Hayes, <laughs> look, I mean – it's one of those, I've been involved where we've dropped back and thrown it 15 or 18 times in a row, right? So I think more than anything else is about what it takes in that moment or that series or that quarter to go out and be efficient. And if it calls for that, absolutely. Um, were we taking anybody by surprise at some point? I don't know that, you have to ask Cleveland. But for us, we felt that was the best way for us to be efficient. Um, it doesn't mean like next week or the following week, that's gonna be the same case. And I always go back to offensive football. 
each game is a different entity in terms of how a defense presents problems. So you have to be able to solve them. And that's our job during the game as coaches is to solve the problems because they're going to be something you haven't seen. They're going to have a, a certain wrinkle that you have to be able to adapt to. And it's our job as coaches to make sure we are able to communicate that to the players and more importantly, like get us into the best situation. At that time, right, it was just basically, you know, finding different ways, not the same, not the same way, but different ways to attacking that defense and there's different run schemes. If, if you don't have Kyle uh, on Sunday with the amount that he, of attention that he gets from opposing defenses, does that alter anything with what you guys do because of that type of attention that he gets? Let's see, smart guy trying to scheme question on the side. Yeah, I won't go into scheme. Look, like I've told you, we have, it is scheme. We, I'll have UMD led right now. You guys are working the angle. Last week it was you, this week, no. Look, it's a great question. The reality is for us, and I'm being as honest and transparent as possible, like we have complete and utter faith whoever gets a helmet on Sunday. And we have a certain way that we like to play football. And we're obviously, it's our job as coaches to put them in the best position to do it. And d Ledger just shook his head on that answer. All right, I next question. That, all, right, but, all right, fine, you can say that, but yeah. I would imagine. I mean it though. I, I know I you have, mean it, yeah. but the skill sets of Kyle Pitts sure. and uh, or versus a uh, but I would say this with coaching are very different. Agreed. I would say this with coaching. It's there's you get to this level, right? To get to the highest level in regardless of sport. But let's talk about this one. There's something that you've done or that you possess as a trait that is elite. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the National Football League. So it's our job as coaches to make sure that we highlight that elite trait and whatever they do well and make sure we keep those players in that position and play away every player in this league, maybe not Brady, but every other player in this league has a deficiency, right? It's just finding out, right, what staying away from their deficiencies and then obviously going out and playing to their strengths. And that's our goal as coaches. OZ has had a lot of balls to the ground yet. He's caught every ball that's been thrown to him, I should say. For 17 yards per catch, and he's it, the one, the plays he's made off the top of my head. He's pretty open. Is he doing something specifically, whether it's scheme knowledge of the defense or something that has made him kind of a big play target and somebody who's yeah, that's a good question. I mean, he's look, he's a pro, and what he's able to do is able to. He's got a very he's a high level of football intelligence and football sense, and so he understands space and timing, and so we have a number of those players that understand that, we, we value that. Um, and he's able to showcase it, and he's been in positions to make those plays. And where I give him and the rest of the offense credit for, when those plays have availed themselves, like guys are making them. And that's obviously the, the biggest goal in the National Football League. There's always going to be an opportunity for a player. Some get a lot more than others. The reality is when an opportunity arises, right, can you cash in on it? And, and that's really, that's what separates longevity as a career in this league and guys that don't last. Can you can you rise it to the moment? And right now, there's a number of guys on offense who are doing that. Going back to the trait thing for a second. Not scheme. I mean, yeah. I can ask scheme, yeah. scheme yeah. questions all yeah. day, yeah. but yeah. I think we're just going to yeah. go back and forth and right. go in a little circle. It'll not be fun for anyone. Uh, when it comes to traits, what is it that Caleb Huntley has trait-wise, to use your word, that made him attractive to y'all and, and, yeah. and put I him think, in this position? I think it's, it's like a number of our players. It's the mindset in which they go about their business and, and the style in which they play. Um, again, some things are measured by a stopwatch, a vertical. Other things, when you put the film on, it's the way that guys approach and play the game. And again, some of those aren't going to be statistical things. And so uh, when you look at certain types of players, the reality is you want guys who love football, more importantly, play with a certain type of edge and physicality. Regardless of position, people just look at the skill position guys with the ball in their hand. It's really everybody. Um, and guys, you know, leave out the quarterback sometime, I would argue. I know I'm biased, but one of the more physical positions to play, right, and toughness. And you have to be able to forget things that just happen, good or bad. And you have to be able to stare in that pocket and not blink. And it goes all through the line. And it's not just that position, but it's the other positions that we're talking about. So to me, it's the way the style play, the physicality in which you play it, and the passion in which you play the game. Why has Marcus had some sort of ball, handling ball control issue every week in the fourth quarter? Yeah, I, I wouldn't look at it that way. I understand the question, and I saw the eyes go up there, D-Led. It's not a scheme question. 
Uh, to me, at the end of the day, it's about making sure that you go back to your fundamentals, right? And the fundamentals are simple as, as you were taught when you were probably a young kid first starting out. If it's a receiver, you look the ball in, right? If you're a back and you're going through the hole and there's potential contact, right? You're going to protect that football at all costs and you're going to somehow find a way to get two hands on it. And there's other positions down the line. So again, I'll always say this when it comes to any kind of physical error, it always goes back to staying on your fundamentals regardless of position.